Well, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Please, please do it some more. I'm kidding. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you for the honor. Uh, you always make me feel like a celebrity anytime I come from the time that I roll into town uh, to the way I'm treated with my hotel room and the gift baskets and just everything. I love the leadership here. You guys are such an amazing church. Uh, I, I look at what God has done with you and what you have contributed to make such a big difference to a generation. And I just want you to know you are crazy amazing. You are crazy amazing. And I love the, the way that all of your teams work, the way you serve. Uh, I've kept up with you all for over 30 years. In fact, uh, pastors Jeff and Beth, some of our dearest friends, we've known them for over 30 years and just have such a, an appreciation for the gift of God in those guys. Aren't they amazing? Aren't they just incredible leaders? So excited about this breakout campaign and what you guys are doing to reach the local community and then what you're doing on a global level. Uh, when I think that you're reaching through the Basics TV program over 1.3 billion people, are you, cra are you kidding? That, that's crazy. That's just over the top. Uh, when you think about 25% of the global population is being exposed, at least in potential, to the Basics TV program, then you bring that down to you, you're making that happen, then you bring that down to the individual you, not just the, the valley, but you and what you're doing. I just, who would have ever thought somebody from Kalamazoo, Michigan could be touching the world? Don't you love that? I, I love that. You should give yourself an applause. Um, as I said, Tina and I uh, have known the Joneses for many, many years, and I remember coming over to their house when the kids were in a picture frame on the wall, and Eric wasn't born yet, he was in the womb, and so his picture was a sonogram. <laughs> That's how long we have history with the Joneses, and I just, I really adore them, I adore the, the kids as well. Let me introduce to you my family, my family. Tina is, we've been married 28 years, isn't she beautiful? I look at her and I'm amazed. I'm amazed she said yes, and I do. And then over to the right is Evan. He is 24. He serves on the team at Elevation Church in Charlotte, North Carolina with Pastor Stephen Furtick. And then to the left is Mitchell. He's 21, and he is at Hillsong uh, along with his cousins, the Joneses. And I uh, told pastors Jeff and Beth to give him a hard time when they're there. Hopefully, they'll buy him some pizza or something. Um, but that's my, my family, and we, uh, they say hi, Tina does, and, and just so honored to, to be here today. Uh, the series that we're in is called Easy Money. Easy Money. I've loved listening to Pastor Jeff talk about, first, the, the heart of money, and then secondly, the health of of money, so practical, you got amazing tools to use. And uh, I'm just gonna tap into the emotional side of that health quotient. When I think of the whole word easy money, the phrase easy money, first thing I think is there ain't nothing easy about money. It's not easy to get, it's not easy to manage, it's not easy to keep, it's not easy to grow, it's not easy to share, it's not easy to relate to. When you saw the picture of Tina, she and I have completely different personalities when it comes to, to money. When I'm five years old, I was given a bank of $5 of nickels. We went on vacation. There was a, an arcade back in those days. It was just pinball machines. And you paid a nickel for them. My brother and I come rolling in. He's two years older than I am. And we start playing these pinball machines, well, uh, as soon as you begin playing, I've got, I got $5 worth. I mean, that's going to go a long way, and I'm so happy about it. I'm playing one little game after another. Before long, we get a bunch of other vacation young people that crowd around to watch. Well, I just love the feeling 
of giving them nickels so they could play. So I start passing the nickels out and people are, I found that I'm their friend. I'm fr- I found that I had some value. It's crazy how emotionally exciting that was. I went through my $5 and nothing flat. And I remember the emotions that were behind it, how that made me feel right up until I ran out of my last nickel. And my feelings changed. I leaned into my brother and I said, hey, Chris, how about some nickels? I'm out of mine. And that little stingy thing, he wouldn't give me a nickel of his. He said, no, you already got rid of all yours. When I was in my teens and early 20s, I had zero concepts of budgets. I heard about them. To me, a budget was if you have the money, spend it. And you tried to stay somewhat close to, you know, whatever income you had. Of course, you had margin with a little credit card. And then I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't really healthy. I knew what, I, I knew it wasn't right. I was told that I needed to have a budget, a real budget. And so I began to work through it with somebody who was coaching me. And as I went through this budget, I realized I don't have enough money to budget. (laughs) At least that's how I interpreted it. And I remember the emotions of that. I remember thinking about how powerless I was for my dreams. I'm a visionary. And I, I remember experiencing All of this shut down. I just, I don't even want to think about it. I just shut down. So I knew I wasn't healthy. Then I met Tina. Tina's background is somehow in her genetic profile, she is just a young girl. I'm talking in that five, six, seven year range. Her siblings and her would be given a quarter whenever they'd go to a convenience store on a vacation trip. And the siblings would go and spend every bit of the quarter as fast as they could and consume the candy as fast as they could. Tina, on the other hand, something in her was completely different. She would take that quarter, she'd buy a one nickel piece of candy and save 20 cents. And then that would accumulate over time. She was a prolific budgeter. She worked at a bank when I met her. She was somebody who was very mindful of her resources. She and I meet, we begin to date, and then we get serious and we have to have the conversation around money. And I'm like, I need you, girl, I need you. (laughs) And she's like, yeah, but I think there's gonna be tension before long because you're gonna feel so constricted for the way I roll because I'm a visionary and she's all about structure. I'm offensive in the game of finances. She's defensive in the game of finances. She's like, we're going to have conflict. And I'm like, no, baby, we probably will. But if, as long as I get to be a part of the budget creation, as soon as I agree to it, I'll do it. You know what she did to me? First year of our marriage. And I agreed to it because I'm like, I need help. I need help. I agreed to a budget that gave me, out of all the other categories, $25 of discretionary spending money each month. You know, I could blow my nose and spend more than $25. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. At the first, I mean, I, very first month we're married, I blew through that $25 in the first two or three days. Then I got to where by the end of the year, I could spread that thing out and I I could manage that for the the year. So Tina gave me a raise in the second year. I got $50. You know how much I got today, 28 years later? $50. I'm 54 years old. I at least ought to get 54, don't you think? That is absolutely crazy. Tina and I have a relationship around money that continues to have a level of tension in it. We have worked on ourselves. We've done things to move ourselves into further health. And I can say when I look at our portfolio, that it's because of Tina's talents that we're able to be in the position that we're in. Today, we have no consumer debt. Our house is paid for, cars paid for. We put two kids through college and that got paid for. We are in trajectory to have our goals in retirement. 
And so we have a great position, and I would give the massive lion's share of the credit to, to Tina in her, her gift set. Wouldn't you think that that would be enough to resolve the tension? Not at all, not even remotely. You see, even today in our lives, Tina, whenever we go on a trip that might be uh, gone for a week or two weeks, she likes to take any of the perishable purchases where food is concerned, and she likes to make sure that we bought just, I mean, just enough or not enough so that when we leave, it was all consumed by us. We wasted nothing. She loves that. You want to get Tina high? Take her to Kohl's and get her a coupon and a vacation. I mean, a, a, a discount. You get her a discount, and she's like, whoo, it's awesome. Give, let her buy something that costs 20 bucks for five bucks, and she is lit, just lit. <laughs> well, see, I'm not that way. What I am is I'm thinking I like my cereal at night and in the morning. Anybody in here, can you relay with me? Because I like my cereal, I want to make sure I got enough milk. Well, Tina, she thinks that when we leave the, the house on that, that trip, the last drop of milk hits the bowl and we are out of milk, that makes her feel like, I won, I'm powerful. What I'm thinking is, is why are we wrestling about milk? And if we come short, it changes my mood. <laughs> if the night before we leave, we ain't got no more milk, I'm thinking to myself, I'm 54 years old. We have financial margin. It's a $1.50 risk. Why are we even talking about it? <laughs> I live one mile from the grocery store, not even a mile. I hop in my car, roll down there and get milk and dump half of a gallon down the sink and I feel okay about it. Now, you take our financial personalities and you spread it across every area of our lives. Again, you can imagine that there is, a, is very, tension, there's conflict. And it's easy to have bias to feel that anybody who doesn't see the world like you do, that they're wrong. And sometimes we are unattuned to the inner workings of why we do what we do. Why is my personality my personality in finances and why is her personality her personality in finances without the judgment of right or wrong? And for you, I'm curious, what is your conflicts? Why do you do what you do? And when you think about money, how do you process the emotions below it? Are you stressed about money? Do money worries keep you up at night? Do you argue with your spouse about money? Are you your own worst enemy when it comes to getting ahead? Do you have guilt and shame because in church, you're going to hear about generosity. You're going to hear about this thing called the tithe, 10%. And what you're going to eventually do is build a shame profile and identity emotionally. I am a spiritual loser because I can't get my stuff together to do the tithe thing. Are you somebody when financial discussions come up? Because in therapy rooms, the two biggest conflicts are around sex and money. And people, wildly enough, do not like talking about sex or money because there's nothing that touches you at the core of who you are like sex and money. Even Jesus would say where your treasure is, there is your heart also. We're talking about something that reflects the deepest sense of belonging and worthiness as to who we are. And so we're dealing with emotions. And when we talk about emotions, we're not just talking about a quote-unquote feeling. This is what I feel. We're talking about something that causes our entire physiology to work the way it works. You function the way you function as a result 
of these things we call emotions that are driven by neurochemicals and the neurochemicals fire off, they get triggered, they move sometimes before your rational brain has anything to even consider or think about it. So why? Why do you do what you do? Don't you think it'd be good to kind of go subterranean? Begin to look underwater and see what it is that's down there? To see why you do what you do. Well, let me tell you where I'm coming from because I'm about to geek out on you for the next 16 minutes. I am a certified professional in the treatment of neurobiological and psychological processes and compulsive and addictive disorders. I've been trained by the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals, and I'm fascinated by human behavior. And I gotta be honest, in many of our stereotypical Christian profiling of why we do what we do, we hit a box and everything has to fit in that box. And we don't understand that the Bible allows for and actually inspires us to think differently about the way we do what we do. So let me take you through a little bit about your brain, why you do what you do. The triune brain was a 1960s presentation by a neuroscientist studying animals. And he said everything began at the brain stem. This is your survival instincts. It's where your sexual drive begins, your need for air, your need for, for protection, your need for food. Anytime any of that is threatened, you don't have to think about it. Your survival brain comes online and fires you up. This is what we might call the primal brain. And then it is connected into the limbic system of your brain, which is where your emotions thrive. Inside of the limbic system is the amygdala, which is your fight, flight, freeze reactions and responses. It also encompasses the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an emotional memory bank. It's a filing system of all of the things that have happened to you, wounds, Wounds, offenses, anytime you bore consequences, your brain takes the emotions of that, puts it in a filing system, and then pulls on it. And then you have the third layer, which is the neocortex. This is your higher reasoning. What's wild is, is that the first two parts, the primal parts of your brain, actually have the rule or the power. 90% of the decisions you make are going to happen in the limbic system of the brain. Now let me talk to you about the biblical concept of the heart. When Jesus or the apostles talked about the heart, they would talk about the heart in correlation to what we know of as these primal parts of the brain. You see, anytime you have the first two parts, the brain stem, the primal brain, the limbic system, whenever those come online, they shut down the prefrontal cortex or the neocortex, which is where you make logical thoughts. So when you're in your normal day life, you have all these perfect plans, right? You hear teaching from God's word, you've got a perfect plan. You sit down with a budget, you have a perfect plan. But then life happens, and every time life happens, the intersection of life with you creates an emotional reaction. You have a fireworks, display of neurochemicals that then create this emotional reaction and you move away from what is your rational ideas or plans. When the Bible talks about the heart, Jesus would say out of the heart proceeds and he moves into thoughts and behaviors. You go back to the book of Proverbs, Solomon would say to guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows all the issues of life. Everything about life is in the heart. When you look at neuroscience and psychology, these two parts of the brain correlate with the heart. So if we could think about what happens in the brain and in the heart, you begin to see a whole different perspective as to why you do what you do. And so this model of behavior, this is your financial personality that I want to talk about. It all in the outer circle is compulsive behavior. So for me, it is I am a spendthrift for the sake of feeling power and control. The reason I like milk, the reason I want to have more than enough resource around me is because I never want to feel like I am a victim. And I have these emotions that make me feel powerless. 
Well, behind that is thoughts and inflamed emotions in Therapy, this would be called, called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's where you get preoccupied, impaired thinking, you have these thoughts, then you lock into those thoughts, those thoughts then inflame emotions. When those emotions get inflamed, the more you think on it, the bigger it gets, and then it moves you to behaviors that sometimes you wish you didn't have. Below the cognitive behavioral sciences is the idea of emotional beliefs. These are your core beliefs. These are not your rational beliefs. These are the beliefs that are in the limbic system or the primal part of your brain. The reason that's so important is, is because remember, if the, this primal part of your brain, the limbic system fires up, it shuts down the rational side of the brain, and you begin to function out of the innermost part. Now, let me just say as a caveat that today our understanding of brain science is much greater than it was in the 1960s when Triune Brain was presented. We know today that there's a lot more complexity, a lot more that happens, but for the sake of human behavior, for the sake of understanding in a compartmentalized way how you do what you do and why you're motivated that way, I still see tremendous value in digging into these components of the brain. Now, the emotional beliefs are actually coming out of your heart. Emotional beliefs are beliefs that are drilled into you. Sometimes you have them before you're even born. They're genetically transfused into you. Even in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about that the curse would go from generation to generation, even to the fourth generation. Well, today we have neurobiological research that shows us that even your great-great-grandparents, that their actual genetic profile can often be put into you, and whatever was in their neural pathways can be passed into you. Isn't that crazy? It's, not, it's almost like God knows more about you than you do. It's kind of interesting to consider. All of that comes from the heart. The heart, again, correlates with this part of the brain, and we've got to consider that when we think about our personalities. So inside of our heart, we've had these trauma experiences, we've encountered wounds, we've, we've had witnessing of things that were consequential to us. We saw somebody suffer. Uh, we felt the power of having money, even as a little kid, and then we felt the power of powerlessness of not having money and what that did to us. And before long, we build these personalities. These core beliefs come up and then they give to us a thought. We get preoccupied on that thought, inflames the emotion, and then we behave in our finances. So today, if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I love hearing about budgeting. Not really. In fact, if I tune in, I hate hearing about budgeting. Because it makes me want to shut down. I get depressed. I feel powerless. And what we do is because we as human beings hate discomfort. We hate the uncomfortableness of our emotion. We tend to ignore it. We turn away and we're like, I don't want to hear that emotion. I don't want to feel that. So we stuff it. And when we stuff it, what we don't know is that it will build steam and finally explode. It's the way you're designed. So when we talk about this explosion, we're talking about mad money, mad money. Mad money is just a street term I would use to describe monetized rage. First, you need to know that there are things called financial disorders built into your neurobiology and psychology. Then at the very root, and I want you to hear the word root, the very root source of financial disorders is monetized rage. And rage is not about healthy anger that addresses injustice, but rage is about intense panic. It is where you feel touched at the very core of your identity, and then because you don't think you're going to be worthy or valuable or accepted or loved, the survival instinct in your primal brain fires up. You've got to self-preserve. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to do something. Well, we repress the attunement to our emotions so well over time that the next thing we know, in the repression of that, those emotions, we end up acting out in passive-aggressive, manipulative, and even exploitive kind of ways. So when we talk about this issue of disorder or the issue of mad money and 
monetize rage, I want to say something to you that will be helpful because we really desire today to tame your shame and make you healthy before you're wealthy. Because some people think that if I'm wealthy, it will solve all of this emotional firestorm on the inside of me that causes me to be the way I am. And in reality, and this is so important, your finances will simply reveal the disorders on the inside of you. They don't fix them. So we want to tame the shame and make you healthy before wealthy. Because many people, when they look at their finances, and they're not good at budgeting or saving, they're not good at doing things that prepare for retirement, they're, they're not good at generosity, they're just not good. And they're like, I am such a stinking loser. And one of the biggest lies that has ever been perpetrated is the idea that you are unchangeable, that you cannot be transformed, that there isn't a restoration or a reprocessing that can take place in your deepest brains. And that lie keeps you in a bound position and you're stuck in life and you hear rational truth constantly and you're like, I agree with that, but you can't change it. It's like Paul would say, he'd say, when I want to do right, I can't do it. And when I don't want to do something, I end up doing it. Oh, wretched man that I am. And what did he say later? He said, what fixes this is thank God through Jesus Christ. He says, what changes me is in the law of the mind bringing us right back to the mystical side of the brain. So, when we talk about these financial disorders, I want to address the idea of your morality and get rid of the shame. Chronic and self-defeating and self-destructive financial behaviors are not driven by rational thinking minds. They stem from psychological forces that are outside our conscious awareness and their roots run deep into our past. You see, this is not a moral issue to have a behavioral disorder. However, it is a moral issue to continue in the disorder without addressing and reprocessing the root causes. So today, if you look at yourself and say, I am jacked, man, when it comes to money. I, I am jacked. And I got to tell you, if you're sitting by somebody that knows you very well, specifically a spouse, they know how jacked you are. But people have a tendency to shame and condemn themselves because of it. And here's the issue. If you're not a tither today, not being a tither or generous person, that is not the moral issue. Listen, listen. The issue is, is once you explore to know why you do what you do, what are you doing to reprocess that, rebuild it, and to be transformed by the power and the grace of God. So again, when we think about these things, let me define a financial disorder. A financial disorder is the persistent patterns of self-destructive, self-limiting, exploitive, manipulative, and controlling behaviors related to your finances. Let me go over some financial disorders with you. First, we have financial money avoidance. This is underspending and excessive risk aversion. This is where you might have financial denial. Financial denial is, is I don't know how much money I have, and I don't want to know. And the idea is, is maybe if I don't know, God will do a miracle. <laughs> then you have financial rejection. We also have money worshiping disorders, things like pathological gambling, workaholism, overspending. This is where you feel power and control in money, and so you hoard it or you have compulsive buying because you want to set apart, you want to rest in and from the anxieties that have been destroying you. You live in this inner script that's telling you things all the time. You think, if I just could hoard enough money, I'd be safe, or if I could just go buy something. It'll at least alleviate the pain temporarily. So I put things on my credit card, and then the next thing I know, I'm feeling alive. I just love my $1,000 Chanel purse. I love my golf clubs. I love my bass boat. Right up until you start getting the bills to make payments and your credit card and interest rates, and then shame enters in, and this is what happens. The stress gets high again. So in purchasing, you got to purchase more because the purchase makes an emotional and uh, neurochemical reaction 
from that you feel good again and you are addicted to the feel good so you got to keep purchasing. These are disorders. I want you to think about relational money. This is where you have financial dependence or financial incest, crazy phrase, but it's real. Financial infidelity, this is where you have secrets. Do you have secret money your spouse doesn't know about? Do you take out a second mortgage on the house without involving your partner? This kind of infidelity, whenever you have betrayals, betrayals on a financial level, actually in the world of recovery and partners from things related to marital breakdown from uh, acting out sexually, the betrayal of finances has a bigger impact on the relationship than even the betrayal of the sexual acting out. Isn't that fascinating? I think it is. Then you have financial enabling. This is where you have failure to launch kids living in the basement. And you enable them, keep enabling them. Financial enmeshment, this is where you are talking to your kids about your financial situation because you want them to meet an emotional need in you. They were not designed to meet your parental emotional need and you keep trying to get them involved in your finances emotionally. And what you end up doing is getting into enmeshment, which you may not know creates a whole neurobiological spin out for them as they get older. Then you've got financial exploitation. Somebody of power comes along and they exploit everybody around them to get what they need. And from that power expression, you have people who are just hungry to feel like that they are uh, upper handed or have an, a one up position. Now, let's look at the Bible at these things. I think this is real interesting. We're going to scoot through this. But in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he talks about the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Let's just stop right there. The love of money. Love is a relational term. That you have an inordinate relationship with money, it will create evil in your life. Or you could say evil in your life comes back to a root system. And the way you interact with money expresses everything else in your life. You see, if I understand, this is crazy, if I understand what's called your arousal template, that's just what causes your emotions to get fired up. If I understand what are the components that make that profile, I can put that over every area of your life and it'll be exactly the same. So if I understand what arouses you with financial finances, what causes you to emotionally fire up around money. If I understand that, I can tell you why all evil is happening in your life. It's as though God understands you more than you understand you. And so we have the roots and we have love. Now, Matthew, Jesus says this, that you're going to love either money or God. You're going to be loyal to money or God, or you're going to serve God or mammon, money. The next part gives us the breakdown of those words. Serve God, love God, devotion to God, serve money, hate, not love God, despise God. Notice there is no in-between. One describes health. The greatest commandment to love God, love people as you love yourself. Love God, love yourself, love people. This is the picture of health. Any inordinate behavior, this is crazy, any inordinate behavior that you have in your life right now is always called an intimacy disorder. It's based in fear. Perfect love cast out fear. So Jesus is asked, what's the healthiest thing you can do as a human? What's the greatest commandment? Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Because you can only love your neighbor as you love yourself. Loving yourself is not somehow being uh, narcissistic. Loving yourself just means you're kind and compassionate to yourself. That you move into self-care. You care about who you are and you care about protecting yourself so that you can be more present and more emotionally generous to the people around you. So we're talking about health here. Now you remember, he says, the love of money is the root. Love of money is the root. Now catch this. This is a crazy verse that's in the book of Hebrews. He says, pursue peace with all people, looking carefully, lest anybody fall short of the grace of God, lest any root, everybody say root. Say it again, root. Lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and by it many become defiled. Now let's define the terms. When he says root, he's talking about a source. This is the very primal part of who you are. Bitterness is not about being in unforgiveness. It's about having a trauma wound in your life. Big T traumas are the intersections of major events 
And then little t traumas are the paper slices upon your skin of life and heart and emotions that happen over and over and over. That if you had primary caretakers who told you you're a loser, you're not smart, you're stupid, you never do anything right, I wish I hadn't have told you to do that because I can never count on you. You heard that script over and over, built a core emotional belief in you, and now you live out of that. And because of that, there is bitterness. The bitterness is that you have a wound on the inside and it built an energy pocket that now when it's touched or triggered, it explodes outward. And that's what springing up tells us about. It's an unsuspecting energy surge outward. Have y'all ever been in a situation where you walked into the house or your spouse walked into the house and they just said something? And one simple statement, like, did you buy butter at the grocery store on your way home from work and you blew up? And you're like, I can't do everything around here. Why do I have to get the butter? And it's like, this really isn't about butter. (laughs) What you have is a bitter energy pocket from wounds of your past, scripts that you emotionally believe about yourself that you're not enough, you're a screw up, you never do anything right. And that got touched with the question, did you pick up the butter? It springs up, it troubles, it excites you, annoys you, disturbs you, it defiles you, it dyes you with color. In other words, it puts a tattoo on your heart of identity. You have an identity tattoo that actually is not built in truth, it's built in wound responses. Don't you find this stuff fascinating? So here's some examples of how these trauma wounds happen. Childhood poverty and unfulfilled wants, parental messages based in their fears, witnessing a parent's career layoff and ensuing struggles, the loss of nest eggs due to economic downturns, experiencing victimization or exploitation by a person of power. All of these things right here can build into you the emotional beliefs that then stir up your thoughts and preoccupation that creates further emotion that then drives you to behavior that you feel is completely uncontrollable. Understand that freedom, freedom, financially and in every other area of life is not that you're not tempted to go another direction. It's not that you don't have a thought. It's that it doesn't carry the power that it used to have to control your life. So here's a question. Do you need help? Look at your neighbor. Ask them that. Do you need help? Turn to the other neighbor. Say, do you need help? Do you need help? Now, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. This really gets to the core issue. Which of these statements creates more anxiety for you? You have no access to God for a year, or you have no access to money for a year? And why? You see, we're addressing issues of the illusion of power and control. Money is deceitful, Jesus said. It will deceive you in believing it has and can do and fulfill what it doesn't have the capacity to do. So when it says to love God or you're going to love money, or when you ask the question, what creates more anxiety, that I don't have access to God, this lets you know where your true emotional beliefs are concerning trusting God, That God is your ultimate and only source of power and control? Or you're putting it in money. Sobering, isn't it? So what do we do now? How do we get healthy? Well, first, because it's a power issue, you got to re-surrender. Re-surrendering is causing yourself to say, wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to live in the illusion. You then re-surrender by giving control and power to God. You begin to exercise yourself in all of your teaching, reprogramming, reprocessing, and you have to do it on an emotional level. You do that in the re-surrender process. Church attendance Serving on a team, tithing, all of these are exercises on the heart. Most people think in religious circles today that you do these things to get brownie points in performance with God. And God's like, are you serious? Is that really what you think this is about? God's like, no, I want you to do this because it's like when you go to a gym. If you just sit and look and admire the weights in the gym, nothing happens. I know. But if you exercise, it transforms you. In the same way, when you do these things, the exercise, listen, on a neurobiological, psychological level, reprocesses you. 
We now know things like participating in worship or mindful meditation. These things actually build the outer structures of your brain. The your amygdala begins to not only reprocess internally, but it begins to change the very structure of the brain by just simple mindful meditation. If you begin to meditate on how God loves you, as you are, not the one you're going to be, that he actually is your prosperity, that redemption took care of you, that you've been equipped with spiritual authority. You meditate on that, your amygdala begins to shift and change. And then when you talk about growing in relational vulnerability, getting in small groups, it's not just being around people, it's finding people that you choose to be vulnerable with. Why? Because you're abdicating control. You're refusing to live in the illusion of power. And then finally, you reprocess the emotional brain with people like, you know, a therapist. I think everybody needs a therapist. You're like, well, that's just for people that are really screwed up. Can we just be honest here? You're screwed up. (laughs) What I wish we could do is just normalize that we all came into this earth as a fallen world and all of us were born with sin, which means we're jacked and our whole spiritual lives, we get born again and then we're growing in transformation. You never get absolute flawlessness or perfection on this earth, which means you're always a work in progress. Something to think about, something to think about. And so, when you think of your activation, Assess the roots of your present choices. Resurrender to God's financial plan. Pursue emotional health towards money. I'd I'd ask you to consider those. If you want to know more about the biblical doctrine behind the model of behavior I went through, if you want to go to point.info slash workshops, find the Science of Freedom. It's a 10-hour e-course that I created, and you can take advantage of that. It has worksheets, things you can dig down into your own stuff. Find out why you do what you do in any area of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of knowing ourselves. One of the beauties of when we get to heaven is we will know even as we are known. Something about you that wants us to understand us. That you want us to be aware of what's happening inside of us. To know the state of our heart. And that, God, you would give us transformation. God, there's people in here today that are living under intense shame. Shame around money. They've lost so much. Shame around decisions they've made financially. Shame around not giving as much as they know they want to. Shame around not having budgets, just being shut down emotionally. God, we know that it's really not even about money. Dude, if somebody will shut down around money, they shut down everywhere because money's just really a magnifying glass of what's happening on the inside. And so today, we surrender ourselves to you. We give you our hearts and minds. and We can't do anything at the choice point today, but what we can choose is to become healthy, to learn and to grow and to use tools to reprocess because Everybody can change. Nobody has to stay the way they are. That is the good news of the gospel. We thank you. In Jesus' name.